Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, your guide to everything love, sex, intimacy, and relationships. Each week, your host, Zach Beach, interviews new experts on love, including couples therapists, relationship coaches, sex educators, and best-selling authors. Learn the best tips and cutting-edge wisdom to better love yourself, others, and the world. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome everybody to the Learn to Love podcast. I am your host, Zach Beach, and I am here with the incredible sex and intimacy coach, Finn Deerhart. Hello, Finn, and welcome to the show. Hey there. Thanks for inviting me on. Our topic for today is inquiry, meaning, and purpose through sex. But before we get into that, let's learn a little more about Finn. For those that don't know, Finn Deerhart is a coach, podcast host, writer, and educator. Finn brings 14 years of combined experience in social anthropology, wellness coaching, spiritual counseling, sex and intimacy coaching, and personal development to his client and couples practice. He is also a staff practitioner for the Queer Couples Center in San Francisco. He is a content creator, on-site coach, and podcast host for Himeros TV, which provides explicit content for queer men looking to find meaning in eroticism, strengthen erotic skills, and create a sense of loving, erotic community with other men. Hello, Finn. How are you today? (laughs) I'm doing good. (laughs) I'm doing well. (laughs) (laughs) So you are a sex and intimacy coach. What kind of clients do you usually work with? Well, I work with a variety of types, but I would say typically it's queer men that I work with, um, although I do have straight couples, um, individuals and couples. And then what are some of the most common issues that your clients, that these queer men come to you and that you help them with? Um, Well, it kind of depends if they're singles. A lot of times it's either challenges in dating and not really feeling fully authentic, going through the motions, wanting something deeper um, in connection with someone, um, kind of feeling timid about sexuality because a Mm -hmm. lot of gay men have been really um, in a really um, broad sexual version of themselves and have enjoyed that. But then they find in dating, they're not knowing how to bring their intimate selves to like the sexual personas that they embody in the world. So there's that piece and like inhibitions and how it shows up in sexuality. And so in couples work, it's similar themes, but it's like men who have maybe hooked up a lot and have a real strong sense of how they like to view themselves sexually. Um, But then when they get into a relationship, they struggle to be able to be like open and expressed because they're not used to being really vulnerable Mm -hmm. uh, around sexuality. So it's just the act of bringing in vulnerability kind of deflates the performative masculine um, self-image. And so there's like this canceling out and there's like a lot of inhibition. So that scares guys, you know, when they can't stay hard or when they feel um, like the sex kind of sucks or if they're... um, you know, feeling nervous and they, we typically don't have to confront that stuff if we're like hooking up as much or a lot of men um, utilize substances to get past that. So, mm-hmm. you know, in the context of relationship, it can really freak them out. So they'll come want to unpack that whenever they get ready. And then some, you know, like body shame, dick shame. Mm-hmm. Some of the some of the broad themes there. <laughs> it's a spectrum for you. No, absolutely. <laughs> it ties into so many things in our culture. You know, there's everything from performative masculinity to inter- internalized homophobia to yeah. just the intimacy that we are seeking in our relationships. Yes. It's interesting to hear from you that you're almost describing that in the dating world, queer men are acting a certain way in their sexual relationships that they then need to shift in more of an intimate relationship. So t- describe to me that shift. What's the like general modus operandi in like the dating world? And then how do we shift into a, that of a healthy and sexual relationship with the, another person? You know, I, I don't think that um, <clears throat> the behaviors all have to shift, but what I think has to shift is the imagination about how we think about sexuality, meaning this, like the split between like, intimate, quote-unquote, intimate sex or, you know, like wild sex 
is not as much, you know, like in what you're doing with your body as much as it is in like how you imagine who you are in those situations. And so a lot of men will access this part of themselves that's like their wild, like animal natures through specific channels, you know, like mm-hmm. um, utilizing substances is a is a quick way to that part of self settings you know like specific like sex parties or clubs or places that hold kind of a mm-hmm. a physical space that people move into but then it helps them open up this internal space in themselves or just like you know behavioral type patterns too that are more about like um like violating prohibition and like naughtiness you know like things that are overturning some of the childhood issues that we all encountered and i say all but most like the great majority of us encountered as children so yeah you get into a relationship and and um, suddenly you're not you're not in those settings or circumstances and so it's just challenging to access that part of oneself uh-huh. but I don't think that's because it's not there or easily could be found I think it's because men in general you know to me this is the work men in general don't have like a really broad understanding of their own emotional inner life mm-hmm. not always and that makes me sad you know i've had to work really hard at that myself to like really own and like deal with my own emotional selves but we right. just weren't taught that you know so um and, and their men are the brunt of jokes a lot about that in the culture and that's really sad i think because we were discouraged from developing that richness and nuanced vocabulary around emotion and like expression of that as little children so if you can't contact that it's hard to really describe your inner life Uh, in general, but in sexuality especially, because there's this heaping pile of shame on top of that too, being gay men in the collective. So you just don't really have a lot to say about it other than like, oh, this is really hot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's really hot. He's really hot. Um, Like, yes, yes, yes. But why? Uh, So anyway, uh, the the great majority of that work, to answer your question, is to really help men start to understand like these you know, parts of yourself that you're finding out here in the hookup world or in certain settings or certain like parts of your mind or even like through sexual visual imagery, which people call porn, um, that those are pieces of yourself that are just all out there and you're finding it in these ways that are external to you, but they're actually inside you as well. And so you're, you know, learning how to cultivate the skills and the awareness around how you're just showing up Mm -hmm. and, For a lot of men, that does mean learning some practical skills as well and just ways of like embodying sexuality a little bit more because so many people in general, it's an intellectual experience like sex. It doesn't, you know, Mm -hmm. does this look right? Do we look right doing this? Are we the right type or together? Does my body look? And you're trying to index it to like pictures that you've seen in the media, right? Or in porn. And it's disconnecting from all that so that you can find a sense of authenticity And then just practice, you know, this really cool thing about being in a partnership is you can really practice once both people really decide to to do the work and can feel safe enough to like drop the facade, you know? Yeah, that's really interesting. Let's go right into that kind of skills or practice. You know, let's say there's a listener and they identify as a man and they also feel like cut off from their emotional world or maybe they've been with partners and they're just like you know talking with you is like talking to a wall like i don't feel anything coming from you what's the first step towards breaking through that barrier of both understanding and communicating our internal emotional world well i think that we have to well, we have to be willing right and i don't think many times i don't think we're willing to do something like that until the discomfort of not doing it supersedes the perceived value and holding on to the facade so like i said you know when guys get into like say they, they're dating a guy i hear this all the time you know i love this guy he's so cool he's really smart he's brilliant he's, he's so sexy he's just he's a, and i have so many and the sex is not we just don't have that great of a you know a sex life and yeah, mm-hmm. you know and they're kind of acknowledging that and that's kind of scary because they're like well I want to be with this person but I don't want to I find that gay men are really 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 protective of sex right so if it's like if you're gonna take this away from me or you know like or you're gonna make me talk about this I've been through so much about all this you're not gonna push on this you know mm-hmm. um, it, they bring that kind of like defense into it I think and that keeps guys. A lot of times maybe from really digging into themselves, but when they feel the effect of the shame that they're carrying or they feel, you know, oh, I might actually lose this guy if I don't figure out what's going on with me. 
um, you know, or something of that nature, then it kind of it brings it to the surface really quickly. Mm-hmm. I think that's the point. Guys start to ask questions. Like it takes a, a sense of curiosity and like, well, what is, what, what is this about me? Like, why, why do I think this is so interesting? Or why do I, you know, da, 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 whatever. That heads directly into the first word of today's topic. When we talk about inquiry mm-hmm. and the inquiry uh, through sex, let's talk about more about what are those questions that we should begin to ask ourselves if we say, feel like we're just on the surface of our sexual lives, or we feel like we need to go deeper in emotional mm-hmm. intimacy, both with ourselves and with others. Um, that's a really good question. I think it probably differs a lot from person to person, you know, like what, what really is active for somebody, you know, there's different, you know, people are all developing at different like places in, in, the, in the journey. But I think for some people, it's like what, turns me on really makes me also feel a sense of disconnection at the same time Mm -hmm. and that sucks and then or for some people it's like i feel kind of um empty like i'm doing all the things that i'm supposed to be doing i feel like i have the body that i'm supposed to have i go to all the parties and i still feel kind of like empty and sad and i don't know why Mm you know, those sorts of questions. Or there's like, again, like with boyfriends, it's like, what about this? You know, like part of me that it's called a love lust split, right? Like this love lust thing, like part of me feels really like I can have this wild sex out there and in, in the scene, quote unquote, but like with my partner, I can't. And like, what is it about myself that's um, divided in that way? You know, and then you kind of start tracing the story of it all. You know, for all these scenarios I mentioned, it's like, what was it like when I first found out about sex? What were my parents' attitudes about it? What was it like at school? Was I bullied? How did I show up in my body whenever I first started to play with myself? You know, like, do I remember? These are all good questions, right? Do I remember? Mm -hmm hiding it and feeling terrified was I clenching down and trying to speed through the process and like in a in a bathroom like in a covert kind of situation or what were my first original erotic turn-ons how did I start to um fuse together certain behaviors and just kind of looking at that history right and Mm -hmm. all along the way and I think if people ask themselves you know like what is it that I want out of my sexual experience um people really want the report you know that they want to have like really positive experience kind of like peak experiences, more sensation, more sense of connectivity, more um, just overall satisfaction, right? But like the reasons that that isn't enjoyed widely is because there's all this like lingering stuff or like I call it like kind of like trash to clean up mm-hmm. that, that was accumulated all along the way um, around who we are, personal shame, collective shame. We have to ask ourselves like, what is it that I'm really honestly saying to myself? Like, what do I truly believe? What do I really look in the mirror and say to myself? You know, what mm-hmm. do I, how do I really judge other guys and their bodies and their cocks? And like, what is just like a deep honesty process? So I think that might be a long answer to your question, but in all that, right, there's like inquiry. There's like, how am I? showing up i absolutely love your answer because it almost seems like we're heading towards using any issues that come up in our sexuality and our intimate relationships as a kind of gateway towards a deeper explanation first we have like an issue come up like we're not able to be fully vulnerable with our partner Mm -hmm. and then we go into all those really wonderful questions that you just mentioned like where are my beliefs coming from what did i learn as a kid And in the answering of those questions, it puts us on that path towards meaning, which is the second word of our topic for today. And I know you have a very interesting backstory around this. So if you're comfortable, like telling our listeners a little bit about your own story, about how you transitioned from this very religious upbringing into your current path as a sexuality and intimacy coach. Yes. Um, Well, I. And you just kind of can corral me if I go on too long about all this, but like, um, or if I forget the question as I go along, <laughs> <laughs> I was um, a minister's kid in the South in the Church of Christ and it was a really, really strict religious upbringing. And also my dad was just kind of severe and it was really forbidden. I mean, sexuality was already forbidden, but definitely being gay would have been a 
I don't I imagined it to be a death wish at the time, but my dad was very adamantly opposed to what he called like homosexuality and the gay agenda and it was one of his major platforms. So I was feeling like, well, we're diametrically opposed. Right? Like early, early on, I knew this, you know. So I went through all that. I lived a double life. I had a rough childhood in a lot of ways. In some ways, it was really positive, but it was really traumatic. And I came out of all that and, and really, really deeply in the closet. And um, I married a woman. I was a minister myself for a while. Wow. Yeah, I went to ministry school when I was 19. And had my own congregation <laughs> that I was preaching to. And it was, I really enjoyed that part of myself in some ways. It just wasn't the message that I felt truly inside me. So mm -hmm. um, that caused a lot of friction, you know, but I went through all that was with her until I was um, like, well, I moved to California. That was in Texas. And I moved to California when I was 29, 30 and ended up coming out of the closet when I was 32. Uh -huh. um, yeah, we had, I mean, she and I dated men together. I was, once we left the church, we went on our own little um, journey and we had both had been like, you know, repressed religious kids. And so we kind of blew up and we're having a lot of fun partying and dating men together. And um, it was the best compromise that I could strike with myself and with her around like my sexuality. But I was always saying that I was bisexual and definitely I was living a double life and cheating on her a lot. And, um, Mm. Yeah, and I didn't, you know, I had all this sex in the closet, and then I came out of the closet, and I was just, like, dating guys and hooking up a lot, and um, again, to what I was saying earlier, I didn't even really feel the effect of all the shame that I'd been carrying, it's almost like it didn't catch up with me fully until, because I dated a few guys, and... um it was really controlling in those relationships in, in a lot of ways, and so I didn't really have to feel it all. When I got into the partnership that I'm in now, actually four and a half years ago i was i was just like it was the most vulnerable i'd ever been in any kind of relationship and it brought everything from way back childhood all the way forward into the present and mm -hmm. then i realized like oh i haven't <laughs> i haven't made space for this <laughs> like i haven't i've been like you know divided and pushing that down so um that brought me into a whole new understanding around my own sexuality. I got into therapy and I started doing a lot of work in this area and that became a life path, path eventually. So for me, back to your question uh -huh. around meaning, I was really looking at and I'm still looking at like this split, you know, that's perceived between sex and spirit and what people think that means, you know, on all sides. And I don't mean spirit in any kind of like mystical kind of way myself, but the realm of that what that means, though, you know, is like meaning and purpose. And um, for me, that's been about healing and letting sex be the vehicle or the access point to essentially go back to the past, you know, and like clean up things that have really hurt for me all along the way. And in the context of a relationship, mm -hmm. it's really been so healing for me to have the partner that I work with this stuff on and I wasn't ready to earlier on like I just wasn't ready to be this vulnerable and to be in the work I just wanted to kind of do my thing and try to be sexy and <laughs> you know <laughs> you know the thing <laughs> yeah I, it sounds like we should add healing and growth through sex also onto the onto the tagline well yeah and I think that people you know like for me it's healing and, and I hear this a lot you know guys are like well that's so heavy or you know I'm like yeah okay is it <laughs> like what was your childhood like what was your you know and then once people start really thinking back and reflecting and it's like not many of us queer men have not been carrying a lot of shit mm -hmm. and it feels heavy because they're not often um really connecting with each other about it you know it's not heavy when everybody's holding it but it is heavy if we all push it away and just let it be in the shadows, you know, and then suffer the isolation or falling underneath that burden. But yeah, and it, it really is different for everybody, you know, like not everybody wants to utilize sexuality as a deep healing practice in, in themselves, but it can still be a way of like really working on one's, you know, relationship to power or relationship to just self-awareness, like what, mm -hmm. what really drives you wild and how to grow as a sexual being. 
I yeah, I really like that growing as a sexual <laughs> being, and I just hear this also in your own path, like which took many decades. And I'm sort of wondering, as you transition from being this minister and having your own congregation to your current path, did you flat out sort of reject all of the belief systems and structures that you kind of grew up with and were also even teaching yourself? Or did you more sort of move away from the teachings that weren't serving you or like around, you know, homophobic beliefs and infuse the, the path and meanings and purposes that were working in what you're currently doing? I love this question. I feel like like rejecting those beliefs is like too um, simple of a rendering. I think, you know, it's really hard to, I mean, one part of you can reject something, right? Like mentally, I can be like, well, that's not true. But your body still holds on to a lot. I mean, my body was shaped informed in this context and um, learned how to suppress certain emotions, learned how to be rigid, you know, and keep a body armor up and learned how to um, armor myself. And then also in just a sexual context, you know, learned how to get off physically to certain emotional states, you know, of anxiety and feeling bad about myself and, you know, um, that all that influences what we look for in the world and out of sexuality. So did I reject it? Yeah. Like I left the church and I went on a, a world religious um, search of sorts. And I also studied anthropology. I've always been very, very interested in all of that intellectually. Um, but I, I found myself coming back around to like a spiritual understanding mm -hmm. of the world um, after I kind of got my rebellious piece out. Absolutely, I don't subscribe to any kind of any kind of religious teaching in the world, any kind of literal way. But I do very much value and appreciate and investigate actively, like religious thought, like the process of religious thought. You know, um, what makes people think these things, what drives them, um, the mythological angle, like what are all these belief systems do? How are they functioning in society? How are they helping hold people together? Um, what are these spiritual realms blueprints for in ourselves you know like with the potentialities of the human development and consciousness so i just i'm very interested in it from that angle so i'd just say it's been updated for me i don't really think of it in the same way it's just more like it's like a meaningful space out there <laughs> that like dreams come from it religions mm -hmm. come from it like fantasy sexual fantasy um it's all kind of tapped into the same source in my mind yeah, let's talk. Let's go right into that because it's really fascinating. This, you know, the same sexual source that you're describing, or like what it means to have authentic sex, or what it means to kind of live mm -hmm. our sexual truth. Because a lot of what we've been talking about so far is sort of unraveling the negative beliefs, unraveling the negative understandings that we have. Whether it's homophobia from the church, whether it's negative body image from the media, mm -hmm. or whether it's just toxic masculinity from our culture. So mm -hmm. here we are peeling away layer after layer after layer. And my question to you is, well, what's underneath that that is like what you might call truth? Or perhaps like what is the thread or that takes us through the maze that we want to like hold on to? How do we know we're living in our sexual truth? Mm. Well, it's such a great question. I mean, and even the fact that you said that the thread through the maze, which I love is a mythical reference. Um, I think that we all know the thread to start pulling on because we know what hurts inside of ourselves. And we might spend like a lot of um, energy trying to keep that put in a little box or away from us or um, not really deal with it or numb, numb ourselves, you know, lots of different ways to deal with pain that, <laughs> that we utilize. And if we start looking into that piece, that's where it all kind of comes unraveled. Um, the authenticity piece, like you asked, is, you know, it's like when we're having sex, are we able to be in our bodies? Are we like thinking the whole time? Are we like indexing ourselves to some standard? Are we like trying to perform and like get off, you know, like like it's I'm fascinated with how many times even I myself right can like launch into fantasy while during sex because like for some reason I'm having a hard time staying present or you know mm -hmm. there's just is that authentic yeah it's authentic for the moment but like if I'm trying to reproduce something that I've seen you know thousands of times on a digital screen not really contacting my own emotional state at the moment it's hard for me to be my most authentic because I think true authenticity requires that we just be like open and clear minded and just like expressing with our bodies 
what we're feeling on the inside. And that might look extremely different than what we've seen in a porn or what we think we're supposed to be doing, you know, action wise. That's one of the reasons I really love embodied tools like Tantra, because they provide these quote unquote sexual experiences, but they don't look anything like what we've seen in media in that way. So it really provides like this like reference point that's outside of our normal way of being. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting. And I'd love to get really right down into it. Um, and sort of delineating between the expectations we get from the media. And Mm -hmm. the expectations could be, you know, from the unrealistic expectations we see in porn, but there's also movies and romantic comedies, which also kind of change our view of what we think sex should look like versus the sort of authentic, real or embodied sex, or just the sex, the playful sex that we do in the bedroom. So my first question is kind of what are some things we might want to let go of that we've seen in porn, in the media, and what are some other things that we want to begin to practice and integrate into our own bedrooms? Well, I love that. And I think letting go of, it's challenging for people to let go of something they don't understand the root Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what is the root of this? So, you know, uh, you know, the practical things are like letting go of having a perfect body, letting go of having a humongous cock, letting go of like, you know, like these experiences that are supposed to be like immediate and without any kind of, you know, lead up, it's just like supposed to just happen like spontaneously and mystically, you know, like kaboom sex happens. And I know that there are time and places for that kind of sex, but it's a prevailing myth. Um, I think, but what's underneath a lot of that for a lot of people is that like, all of that symbolizes something. So it's beyond just like the body types or some that are shown, right? So those body types are like the embodied form of um, concepts that our culture uh, really puts on an altar, like might maybe, like strength, um, like being in control. Um, there's a performative aspect of it, right? So there's just a lot that's it's symbolic and it's underneath all the imagery. So it's hard for people to let go of those things if they're really still on some level subscribing to these ideas um, like fully and then also holding themselves accountable to them, right? So if I'm, if, for instance, if I'm supposed to be really, really strong um, or, you know, take up a lot of space or something, well, it's maybe I can like accept my body for what it is, but if I still really hold on to that belief, it's going to put me in conflict with what's going on. Maybe if I'm actually feeling very tender or feeling um, slow or feeling, you know, like I want to just let go of control. So it's, I think it's, it's a lot, it's complex, right? Mm -hmm. Those images, those images out there exist for a lot of different reasons, but in, you know, does that answer your question? Like it's, Kind of a roundabout answer, I guess. <laughs> I think, you know, like, practically, yeah, letting go of, like, you know, the myth of spontaneity, right? Like, it's there's an element of spontaneity that happens, but after we actually cultivate a lot of energy towards a certain point. So, you know, in, like, gay men that cruise, for instance, yes, there's a spontaneity in that. Where, like, we see someone and it, like, lights us up and we kind of move in the direction towards sex and it feels very spontaneous but what's not maybe being um acknowledged is like the amount of time that one like really thinks about it and puts energy in that direction goes hunting uh you know there's a lot more than just like this one poof moment and the same thing in like dating right you first start dating someone you might be thinking for days about when you're going to see them what you're going to wear what it's going to be like all these fantasies and then when you see them finally then there's an explosion but that's because you've already intended lots of energy in that direction. So I think porn really, in in a lot of contexts, just it's like you walk in and it just happens. There's no like, there's no like depiction of the energy or the internal world of the person that's experiencing it either. You know? No, no I get it. Po- go ahead. Go ahead. Um, no, I I do like your answer because it, you're bringing up a lot of what we see. The first issue that I'm hearing from you is just body image. Is that we think our body needs to look or be a certain way. You see right. incredibly good-looking people on the media. You see literal model, models in, in pornography. And then we can become obviously quite self-conscious about our bodies. Mm-hmm. Along with body image, there's like the performance aspect where you, you, know, you watch a romantic comedy and these two people are madly in love with each other and they burst in through the apartment and start tearing each other's clothes off. And there's no communication. There's no discussion. There's no foreplay. There's no right. like, these mm-hmm. are the things we like to do in order to get turned on. There's no like cleaning the kitchen before, like, <laughs> right. before right. you kind of enter into the bedroom. 
And then, and yeah, the final and most important one that I'm hearing from you is the sort of respecting and honoring our internal experience and our internal world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In pornography, it's just, it's very physical. There's just two bodies, you know, going at each other. But we are emotional beings. We are mental beings. We are spiritual beings. And, you know, these vulnerabilities can very easily come up. And I'd love to just get into that in terms of how to sort of bring in vulnerability into the bedroom. You know, somebody might not even feel comfortable seeing them, looking at themselves, you know, naked because they see like all their imperfections, so to speak. And that can easily be an obstacle when uh, becoming naked with another person. So when we talk about body shame and other insecurities that we may have, how do we sort of respect and honor that and then move forward in a very intimate way? Well, when you say respect and honor it, do you mean like, how do we accept it? Or how do we like, um, you, like bring that in and without it just shutting us down? Like, what do you, what exactly do you mean? I think a huge image we get from the media is that all you need for amazing and hot and passionate sex in the bedroom is two attractive people, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) (laughs) There's also a lot of um, gender norms around how sex, you know, operates. Like a woman's sexuality is kind of viewed as very complex and a man's sexuality is viewed as very simple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oftentimes men are just assumed to always be ready. Right, And I know a lot of men who are actually like, I love to feel loved and accepted and emotionally connected to somebody before I I enter into any sort of intimate relationship with. Mm -hmm. So there is a sort of way of we want want to address it or bring it up or do things with our partner before we just tear our clothes off and like hop into bed. And that can be very vulnerable. It can be very scary to sort of share insecurities or to even express like what we want, what we need, you know, it can be an extraordinary challenge for a lot of people to express something that they want or need in the bedroom. And it could be because they think that Mm -hmm. the person should just know this. um, But it can also just bring up certain shame, like you might be into certain things that you might not feel comfortable expressing or sharing with your partner. I totally agree. Well, kind of thinking about your original question on body shame, I think that there's like no way around just accepting what we're feeling. You know, that's what's hard um, because you had originally said like someone not feeling comfortable about their body. Sex in general, I know I'm generalizing when I say this, but it is a very, very vulnerable place for a lot of people, right? It is. um, And maybe someone feels a sense of power there because of a a kind of validation that that they might be receiving. And that's that's one level of it. But I think um, in general, there's just since it's so vulnerable, there's all these misconceptions about it because there's not like a really strong sense of like understanding there. It's like um, the smoke and mirrors a lot. Like you said, the two, two attractive bodies and that's supposed to make great sex. Well, that's because there's not really a internal structure in many people that understands it's a way to like use your body to express mm-hmm. the emotions that you're feeling, you know? So if your emotions on the inside are feeling shame, feeling um, dirty, feeling um, like your body's not good enough, feeling, you know, all these, and then you're trying to, you know, split that off so that you can have this hot sex over here on the other side of you. Um, It's like splitting your experience and it takes energy to separate the emotions from what's happening. The best route in my mind is to like make space for and do the healing work around the body shame, around the image, like feeling empathy for like having ingested all this shit out there that's telling us a certain thing or like from maybe the spiritual and emotional abuse that we received as children that kept us from feeling really connected to something that is ours by birthright and feels really good and um that can't be skipped over because uh yeah you might be able to mute it but i think when you mute something you mute everything you can't selectively mute your experience so you suppress these feelings of shame or not liking your body, you're also suppressing your capacity for joy and excitement and sensation. And the general bypasses around all of that is to just take a substance and you can just like hop over it and get into the like the feeling good or settings, you know, certain settings like a hookup where you control every single thing about the situation because you pre-negotiate before you get there. Like you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And I'm going to do this. And then, you, you know, you kind of bypass the stuff that's like really vulnerable and tender. Um, again, that's not a commentary saying that those things are bad. It's just like it to me, it testifies to the amount of vulnerability there and like an opportunity for growth and expansion and also like as a spiritual path. I love that. I love 
the growth and expansion and spiritual path and using sex to sort of progress our way on that right. path. And what I'm sort of wondering is what are some first steps? What are some specific steps? Let's say I'm listening to this podcast right now and I really want to start doing these things. I want to do the healing work that you mentioned. I want to do the embodied practices like Tantra. I want to go to the places that are tender. Mm -hmm. And right now we're kind of talking rather abstractly. Right. What are like maybe a specific tool, specific exercises, specific practice that you might encourage somebody to do or somebody to look into in order to go into those places that are tender, find the strength to be vulnerable in the bedroom? Um, I would say one of the best ways to start is something like super um, a classic way to monitor one's self and thoughts is to journal, you know, mm. like to set up a, jour a journal specifically for your erotic exploration. And, you know, like notice if you want to edit yourself, just be really you know, like notice the tendency to tell the truth with yourself about what turns you on and what where you know what your feelings are and just start to monitor and track that so that you bring awareness to what you're thinking. For self pleasure, you know, like for a lot of people, like they don't play with themselves unless it's like a reactive moment it's like they're bored they're horny they have this like oh i can't i don't want to focus on this work so they just hop over to like Pornhub and then they start pleasuring themselves is like a, i sometimes it's like a claim at after you know at agency after being trapped or something uh, in work or but to make it affirmative to make time and space to say okay i'm gonna spend two hours uh tomorrow just exploring my body and making this affirmative stance around it, time and space in your day and your calendar, and then doing the best that you can to, to do that with just your own fantasy life and maybe without visual stimulation mm -hmm. as an mm -hmm. experiment. Because when you do that, you can like really track again your own thought process, your own um, body in a way where, where do I feel the most pleasure? And then following the sensation, really focusing on your breath and like following just tracking where the sensation lives in your body, touching yourself everywhere. If you want to upgrade it, doing it in a mirror because then you get to look at yourself while you do it and really behold like the your erotic identity. And you'll and a lot of people start to hear like the voices of like the nagging, you know, Ugh, I don't like this, I don't mm -hmm. like that, blah, blah, blah. But it gives you a space to start, right? And then you go back to your journal and you jot that stuff down and you go, wow, this is what I did today. Like I... I struggled. I looked at myself there. I didn't. I talked shit about this. I talked shit about that. Well, all that stuff is coming up in your sex. It's just maybe you're hiding it. Maybe you're doing a really good job of compartmentalizing it, but it's there. So if it's in the mirror, it's in the connections with people. Um, and a lot of people really like that this too, because they're like, I actually get into it. It's fun to, to look at myself and to find, I think the objective is to find in yourself the energy and the the embodiment of some of the things that you really like out there in the world things that really turn you on so if a certain kind of guy turns you on you kind of look at the symbolism around that and try to find those same qualities in yourself and so you start to really put together the body again in a different way so instead of comparing yourself to other people you start to see how you actually hold that energy as well that's a great place to start. Also, if you want to do it with porn too, you can do it, which I actually like to call that um, visual imagery. I'm trying to quit using the word porn, but um, just to destigmatize it even more. But visual imagery, you look at it and then you really notice what turns you on and write that down in your journal. So like keep a collection of like the exact moment that this video really got your attention. Like what was it about that? Was it the sound that this person was making? Was it like the movements? Was it like, um, you know, something about that scene? And that's a clue to your own emotional erotic identity and it's a really big big step um yeah absolutely those are some really wonderful first steps and they almost immediately tie into again our topic for today inquiry meaning and purpose because your first recommendation mm -hmm. was a journal for erotic exploration which goes right into mm -hmm. that inquiry of looking into what do we feel about sex what are some things that we've gained uh along the way what turns us on yeah and then I really love that sort of self-pleasure with intention. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us get off. I read a study that the average visitor to Pornhub is there for about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so you just kind of in, do your thing, and then head out. And while well, moving away from the visual imagery and do what you might even call just making love to yourself, going about your self-pleasure in a really intentional way of, of both care and also like exploration and curiosity and also affirming that you do indeed deserve pleasure and to feel good in your body. Yeah. 
And then our final like task, and we are running out of time, so I wouldn't mind just focusing on this last last word in our topic, okay, which okay. is finding purpose. Yeah. And I wouldn't mind hearing just a little bit more about your experience and how you might translate that into the work that you that you do, because it sounds like in your own exploration, in that your own coming out. Uh, out, out of the closet in your own moving away from your religious background from being a minister is that through your own expression of your sexuality you also found like your path in life would you say that you found your purpose through your own sexual healing uh well i would say it's, it's tricky right it's a trick of the words i would say that my, the healing is my purpose really just experiencing and healing mm. like being able to really fully inhabit my body being really fully inhabit my world and all the the coming undone of um bodily structure that i've taken on you know like the armoring the way that i guard myself the way that i like construct myself in the physical form but also even in the emotional space and for me, you know, like the, the quote by Socrates, the like the wound is the me- medicine. Um, I believe it was Socrates. I could be mistaken. But yeah, but the wound being the medicine, meaning like, well, how did sex become this pathway for me? Well, because it hurt a lot and because mm. I mm-hmm. emotionally had a lot of baggage there, you know. And at the same time, there's been this pressure on me to be like super hot and to be having lots of sex and all, you know, all this stuff. And so, you know, following those desires into the thick of the stuff that also is like really festering beneath the surface. And I think tuning into that instead of like trying to get away from it, you know. So that is a purposeful thing because – it's a template to help me understand like a healing process and how that works for other people as well. And also just our world, you know? Yeah. That's, that's so beautiful. I, I love that idea of basically healing can be part of your purpose or your purpose literally can be healing because mm-hmm. I think a lot of people feel that they need to heal themselves first in order to mm-hmm. like truly flower in the world, mm-hmm. but they can work in tandem and they can work hand in hand. So how do you kind of help other people also discover their purpose? Do you also find that the healing and the purpose discovery work hand in hand? I think, yes, because I think in seeking and discovering you uncover, it's like this inside outside, right? Like the underbelly of the, of the what's visible. I think we find the shadow in the search for light or we find the light in the search for shadow. It's kind of all the same and... Um, Did you say that again? I've never heard that. I've never well, I think when we like seek light, we find the shadow. Mm. You know, we can't cut it off. And mm. then finding, and then like if we're just seeking shadow, uh, we find the light. And there's another tantric mm-hmm. principle that I really love, and it's like follow the fantasy, like really follow the desire, and with a practice awareness about what happens when you do it. So instead of trying to moderate behavior and like really suppress things that come up for you beyond sex, even just like life pursuits ways of putting yourself into the world, but sexual desires, you know, of course, follow it with the practice awareness of what happens when you do that. Like, what does it yield for you? What comes up for you? What are the emotions that are surrounding that for you? How does it affect your life, your friendships, your relationships? It's all part of that, that same process. It's just like healing. And then I think the trick for all of us is to practice the awareness, Mm. you know, because we can go have pleasure for pleasure's sake, and that's good. But for me, it's like it, pleasure on top of trauma doesn't like heal the trauma. It just it's like an experience and it needs like this connective tissue to integrate and to heal, which is the awareness piece. You've mentioned the word tantra a number of times. And I wouldn't mind just unpacking this word real quick, because I think you probably have a very unique perspective on tantra, particularly from your queer background, because a lot of times you go to a tantra workshop and they will literally divide the men and the women and they will talk (laughs) about the divine masculine and the divine feminine, feminine and then the polarity of where attraction lies. So as a gay man, tell us about what does Tantra mean to you? Um, well, I, I, I agree with you. Like there's like this, um, okay, for instance, religion in, in general has a structural component to house like a metaphorical conversation. And all of that is like a coordinate to a plane of consciousness of some kind. So even you know, imagining deities, imagining heaven, imagining whatever, it corresponds to a pen- potentiality in our selves and in our lives and what's possible 
And Tantra, I look at it in the same way. I mean, the word Tantra means the weave, right? Um, Mm -hmm. It is like a very integrated kind of um, experience where we're looking at all of us. So like what it is, all of ourselves, basically, like what the things that would be quote unquote shadow and how to bring them in or how we want to like skip over all that maybe and like ascend quote unquote. And it's a it's an integration kind of journey. So yeah, you get to a, a workshop, and I've been in those situations, like in a very heterocentric type workshop, and I felt so out of place because I couldn't quite relate. Gay sex in the world of gay sex is largely very very different than the kind of rituals that are practiced in that you know in, in like traditional classic tantra. But that does not mean to me that that is like an outdated kind of system or whatever what i just think it means is like okay that's like the religious component but the spirituality is like how one experiences those things and how they interpret them for themselves and there are there are quite a few people that are really starting to reimagine the principles of tantra because that's all an internal thing right you brought up queer men and how that those it's very like diametrically opposed right the the feminine and the masculine um forces that create a polarity but uh, polarity is created out of lots of different things you know Mm -hmm. um it doesn't have to be on the spectrum of like masculinity to femininity. It can be on a spectrum of like pain um, and impact to soft tenderness. It can be um, like loudness to softness. It, like, there's just so many different ways that we can coordinate polarity mm-hmm. um, in the traditional form, right? Women are a particular set or a domain of those characteristics and the masculine is another set of those characteristics. But truly those characteristics are shared by both genders and now that gender is under like a lot of revision in our culture and in the queer community um it just kind of tosses all that in the air and we i think we just kind of find our own meaning in it and it's being reinterpreted there's a there's an amazing book called the man tantra letters that's um about tantra and the way that men engage with it Mm -hmm. um did that answer your question yeah for sure and the the follow-up question to that is how do you personally bring the practices of tantra into your life well so that's i love that i don't personally um practice any kind of um tantra as a regular path what i kind of view it as since i'm a sex counselor and i spend a lot of my time in the psychological space i look at tantra as like a way to kind of spiritualize um a lot of the same stuff that men are working out in the counseling kind of space. So it brings like this level of of, um, spirituality into it that I don't really think that in therapeutic space is often like that's not their space, right? They're trying to help break down defenses and help people open up to their own healing processes. So it brings a dimension of spirituality into it, but it's also rich with embodied tools, right? So it practices, exercises, ways to um, experience sexuality. They're very, very different. So for me, like doing some of the exercises that I've learned in Tantra workshops or that I've encountered studying with Jason Tai, who is also known as Jason Tantra, I have been able to experience things with my partner that have helped me open up and heal because it gives your body a different way to in, like to access some of this stuff than like the normal ways that we go about it and the different channels that we, you know, move in to create sex. So it's like, wow, this doesn't feel like quote unquote hooking up, but I'm having these same feelings, sensations and experiences, but there's it's just a very different kind of um way to be in it, so it's a behavioral exercise. So I utilize those in my own partnership uh, to get past inhibitions and like blocks and maybe blocks in perception that I have about myself or about him Mm -hmm. and also with my clients too to give them experiments to do something different than what they're already doing I love hearing your perspective Finn you have such a unique experience and a unique life path and you bring in so many important aspects about love Um, we've already talked about self-love We've talked about love for another person. And you also bring in this very spiritual and religious perspective about all the really beautiful things that love can be. I wish we could just talk all day. I, I feel <laughs> <Thank> like <laughs> I almost like bowing down to the guru here. Because... Oh, whatever. <laughs> the loquacious <And> one. <laughs> so I wouldn't mind just finishing with just a little loving thought. And just asking you, um, what do you wish everyone knew about love? Mm, that it lives in the places that you don't expect it the very most. Mm. That like in the places that hurt the most in us is exactly where we need to go to find the love. Mm. And that that can really open up a tremendous experience if we have the bravery to go there. Wow. 
Goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> well, the places that have really sucked and like hurt so much in my life are like the sources now that I'm really trying to tap into. They're like are propelling me, you know, and the traumas that I've been through. That's where the love is because those are all the reasons why we think we're not worthy or we can't have it or people should pay now or, you know, whatever we're, whatever we're experiencing. And um, if we can be brave enough, if we can find the tools to help us, if we can, you know, trust other people um, to let them in, well, that's where that just flows. Absolutely. You are like the living proof that like anything is possible and we can all live a life of love and joy and happiness. And it might take a little time. It still blows my mind to, you know, three decades to for you to come out of the closet, but you did it. And now mm -hmm. you're just living this totally mm -hmm. fully expressed uh, life, living your purpose and helping other people live their purpose as well. Mm. Thank you for that yeah so thank you so much finn uh <laughs> for coming on the show how do people find you and follow you and work with you yeah thanks for inviting me and for reaching out to me too um and i i enjoy talking with you i think we are we could probably just chat and chat um <laughs> i if you if you're listening you want to follow more of my stuff it's on my website i think it's pretty good hub for everything that's going on um, findearheart.com f i n n d e e r h a r t.com wonderful thank you again finn for sharing your wisdom and for joining us on the show and thank you listeners for listening to this show we hope you learned something and we hope you realize that love is everywhere including the tender places including the shadows including the scary places and that no matter what it is that you're going through there is hope there is light in behind and as part of every shadow may you continue to live with love in your heart and if you want to learn more about me or the show feel free to head to zachbeach.com and theheartcenter.com <laughs> Thanks again for listening to the Learn to Love podcast. To learn more about the show and your host, head over to ZachBeach.com or TheHeartCenter.com. You can also follow Zach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.